Even in my very first film, Johnny Suede, I met yeah. this young unknown actor uh, who had come in to audition for me. This was my first film. You know, we had looked and looked and looked and, and could not find someone to play this part because either they, 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 they just were too stupid or they didn't get it, that there was, there was a, a vulnerability to this character. And uh, my casting director said to me, there's this young guy coming in today. You know, when you look at his resume, don't be uh, freak. He's got a he got one little tiny Canadian TV series on it, and this movie that's just finished shooting that nobody has seen, called Thelma and Louise. I looked at his picture. And I said he looks interesting. Bring him in. The second I saw Brad Pitt walk in, I said two things: A, this is my guy. This is Johnny Swade. And B, this guy's going to be a star. All right, I cast him. I called the agent. Yep, yep, you're cast. My producer goes, whoa, 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 whoa. What are you talking about? You're not casting that guy. I said, what? This, this was like a $500,000 movie in 1991. He goes, yeah, I'm not, I'm not paying for that guy. He's nobody. He just he refused to, to compromise in any way. I had to turn my back on this guy's money. That's how confident I was that Brad was the guy. Hey everybody, you're listening to Film Wax Radio. I'm your host, Adam Shartoff. This is episode number 412. Welcome back for another episode this week. This is the second episode. We posted an episode on the Maryland Film Festival a couple of days ago. I'm back with a brand new episode. I wanted to get this up today because Tom DiCillo, who has been on my podcast before, he was on episode 321 from the Woodstock Film Festival a couple of years ago. And he's back finally uh, where... By he is finally getting a screening here in New York City of his new film. It's a, well, to say it's a documentary is not really accurate. It's a work of nonfiction, let's put it that way. And it's called Down in Shadowland, and it is going to be screening at the IFC Center on Monday, the June the 19th. I will be there. There is going to be a Q&A uh, with Steve Buscemi moderating, and it should be a great evening. So I don't know if there's any tickets left, but you can check by going to the IFC Center's website and checking it out if you live in the New York City area. Uh, regardless, hopefully you'll have an opportunity to see Down in Shadowland at some point soon. It's an unusual film for Tom. He's never really made a film like this, but it's extremely personal. And speaking of personal, we do get somewhat personal in this conversation. Since I had Tom on last time, we've gotten to know each other somewhat well, and you know, become friends. He's gone through a very, very uh, turbulent period of time in the last year. He lost his wife and he made this film and it, you know, so it's an extremely intense period of time. But he's an artist and so the work that he's creating kind of reflects where he's at right now. Anyway, so I, I, I went up to see Tom in his apartment on the Upper West Side few weeks ago when we recorded this and i'm happy to post it uh for you um episode number 412 so we're gonna go into that in just a minute i want to thank uh my friends at magic drop we're gonna do a little commercial in a minute uh but uh it's been a great to having them on the last bunch of episodes if you're a filmmaker and uh if you uh have licensing issues with the music you're using listen to this please Magic Drop is a music licensing business based in Brooklyn, New York, which represents an eclectic roster of bands and composers licensing their music for use in films, TV, and beyond. Magic Drop works directly with clients to find songs or instrumentals from a catalog of a thousand plus tracks by artists with distinctive developed voices. Magic Drop offers competitive rates and festival licenses for independent filmmakers. Visit magicdropmusic.com or email contact at magicdropmusic.com for more information. Again, that's Magic Drop. So we thank our friends at Magic Drop for sponsoring the last half dozen episodes of the podcast. Uh, after Tom's appearance, we're going to go into another segment, this one with Karen Cooper. I had Bruce Goldstein on a few months ago. Well, now Karen Cooper. Both are from Film Forum, and Karen programs the contemporary cinema and whereas Bruce does the repertory. So they both work alongside one another. And Karen Cooper wanted her on for years, finally got her on. So you're going to hear my conversation with a real institution, not just Film Forum, but Karen Cooper herself, a real New York film institution. We'll get to that in just a little while. 
But first up here, let's see, Tom Ticillo came on the scene in the early 90s, I guess. I first, of course, ran into him a little earlier than that when I accidentally walked into Stranger Than Paradise, the Jim Jarmusch movie, and uh, Tom shot that movie. He was a da- you know, downtowner. He moved to New York not that long before and got caught up in the whole art scene, ended up going to NYU film school and making some seminal films, including Johnny Suede, which he talks about on this coming uh, episode in Living in Oblivion. Those two movies were part of a whole movement of independent film coming out of New York in the uh, 90s. Subsequently, he has made Box of Moonlight. He's made Delirious. He made a Doors film, The Doors When You're Strange. And now he has a, this new film called Down in Shadowlands. Without any further delay, let's get into this, my conversation with the returning Tom DiCillo here on Film Wax Radio. How are you? I'm good. I'm, I'm you know, I'm really excited about uh, this film. Mm-hmm. Um, it has taken quite a while to find the 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 finished form of it and mm-hmm. i and I, I really feel confident that i have yeah. uh and just the other day i looked at the, the the finished print of it with a brand new sound mix that i did and it just i'm really really pleased with the way it came together mm-hmm. it's uh it's lean it's uh uh, having <laughs> having shot st- started shooting this film i believe in 2007 or 2009 wow yeah uh you can imagine the amount of footage that i have and to glean it so yeah. that i only took the stuff that i felt was the most real and the most powerful uh i i, I feel like i did that mm-hmm. and that was quite that was the, the the editing actually was the toughest part of this whole movie right was finding a shape for it finding a form and then and then structuring it so i'm excited you know it's there there'll be uh you know 200 people sitting watching this movie right at the ifc center at the ifc on uh, june june 19th 19th uh at 7 30 and steve buscemi is going to introduce the film and do a q a with me so that's that's great he yeah. you know i just sent him the film and he just wrote me back the most amazing email in which he was talking about how much he was moved and impressed by the film and and it was completely unsolicited i didn't ask him for that and right. uh it meant so much to me i mean he 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 kind of implied that he thought it was one of my best movies which mm-hmm. listen whether i agree or i don't agree i it's hard to like say whether i do or i don't without sounding somewhat self-involved right but but you know there was a reason why I continued to work on this movie uh, for over eight years. It's because I believed in it. Mm-hmm. And it was it was very encouraging to hear Steve access what it was that I was trying to do with the film, mm-hmm. you know, uh, effortlessly. So. Mm. Well, maybe at some point I'll have an opportunity to bring him on and, and ask him directly. You know? I hadn't seen... Uh, I hadn't seen Down to Shadowland, which is the film we've been talking about mm. before I met you. I saw it the, literally, I think, the night before we sat down, right. and, and uh, which was, I guess, one of your uh, somewhat earlier draft of the right. film. Yeah, so it has changed quite a bit since then. Yeah, and, and I've seen one since. I wonder if it's changed since, because at one point you sent me a disc or mm. gave me one with a more, you know, a newer edit, right. and a more updated edit. Which I could see, you know, if this guy's putting a lot of work into yes. this film. Yeah. But just based also on your earlier films, yeah, I just felt this is somebody I can relate to, at least in terms of his artistic vision. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I got that from your earlier films. So, well, thank you. Uh, yeah. So, in all this time, though, and I know you have had going through, you know, obviously a lot of personal stuff has been going on the last couple of years. Right. That's probably taken up a lot of your time. Is this been, in a way, a real sort? Has it been for you this film without sounding cliche? But is it uh, been a help to have to lean on this work? Yeah, in a way, and that's, a, it... that's a really good question, uh, Adam. Um, one of the you know the real privileges and advantages of doing something on your own is that you can work on it whenever you want to, and. I shot this film myself. I edited it right here. Uh-huh. Uh, most of the music that's in it that I composed, I composed right here. 
And so, you know, literally, uh, you know, at, at 10 o'clock at night, if I felt like, you know, going back in and tweaking and relooking and, and, you know, working on a section, reworking it, I could do it. And, uh, there is something really freeing about that. I, I, I've often felt that in some of my, you know, financed films that, that the, the, the structure of, you know, when you shoot, the structure of when you edit, everything. It, it's like, you know, you know, one film sort of squeaked through where I feel like everything that I wanted to put in it is in it, and that was Living in Oblivion. Mm -hmm. Because in a way, we, we sh I think only one scene not, ended up not in the movie. Uh, is that know, right? Yeah. Um, that's that's yes. quite a... Uh, <laughs> it is. Uh, but, so, that's amazing, actually. I mean, what I loved about this project was that mm -hmm. it started out as just... It started out on the shot level. In other words... I'd be sitting on the train, and I'd see something happening, and I go, "Wow! I wish I had my camera." Now, not a still camera, although a, st a still photographer really influenced me. Gary Winogrand, you know, he's a black and white photographer. Street Gary, photographer was yeah. he? Is he, mm -hmm. he was in the '60s. I have his book over here. I'll show you. Oh yeah, I'd love uh, to see it. Mm -hmm. uh, but he he captured these moments of of like, of of just human interaction or, mm. or people being alone. Uh, that that just spoke volumes you know and i said to myself i wonder if i could do that with the movie camera you know and so i started shooting and you know i got some amazing footage you know but then the question of course became well how do you put it all together you know what as as interesting as some of these shots were uh the idea of of somebody just sitting there staring after shot at shot after shot was was uh you know, daunting, because right? who would want to do that? I wouldn't want to do that, you know. But just the fact that I could go out and shoot whenever I wanted to shoot, whatever I wanted to shoot, was, I don't know, I just, uh, it, it enabled me to discover a form of filmmaking that felt very real to me, which was, which was, you, I get a bunch of broad strokes, all these shots that I shot. Then I, then I could look at it. It's almost like, you know, poetry. And you say, okay, does, do these words go together? What's the emotion that comes from these three shots going together? Right. Okay, then you take those three shots and you put 20 shots together. And you have a kind of a scene. And you go, okay, what's that telling me? Where's that going? And it, it was, I was kind of writing the film uh, as I was shooting and editing. And, and uh I, you know, hopefully, you know, the next film won't take nine years, but um, <laughs> I feel that... I hope so, too. I feel that the work uh. that went into it is very evident in the film. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's like looking at a, a piece of architecture or something. You look at at, at Notre Dame. I'm not, I'm not comparing my film to Notre Dame, but I'm saying... Yeah, it's much better. Well, you... <laughs> I know you what look you're at the, You look at the <laughs> centuries of work that went into building the cathedral. And you, you know, you have to stand back and 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 you know have some awe about it. You know what yeah. I mean? Well, could you have made any any other kind of film project would have been competing for a lot of your time and in your energy. Right. Yeah. In the, you know, in the last couple of years, anyway, maybe That's true. maybe a few years. Did you get to see this work? Did you get to see it? And yeah, she did. Mm -hmm. She did. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, you're referring to the fact that my wife passed away yeah. in October, and it was it was intense. It still is. She had a a two year battle with leukemia. And uh, I just, I stopped everything just right. to uh, take care of her. I don't regret a second of it, you know. I think about her constantly. And, uh, you know, she saw what I was doing. And, and, you know, always a little, like, since it wasn't a financed film, I was paying for it. She had, a you know, a little bit of anxiety about what the hell I was doing. <laughs> and, you know. Are you going to be okay? It, well, also, you know, how much was I going to spend? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Right. Uh, it could be a, re a yes. sinkhole or whatever you want to call it. But she yeah. liked it. She yeah. liked it a lot. I mm -hmm. mean, it's a, it's a very personal film. And, and I just say to myself, especially today, you know, the only thing that matters really is that it's something that is truly meaningful to to you. That's it. That's right. all that matters. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that it that it's a, a piece of work that is only meaningful to me because if I felt that... I never would have made it. Mm -hmm. You know, as an artist, I think I'm able to discern and to tell, okay, this is this is just something 
for me. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, and to, to always know that, that, you know what, well, I do think audiences would appreciate this. And I put a lot of thought into, into keeping that in mind. You know, the photographer you mentioned, Gary Winograd, Winograd, right? Winograd. He was uh, obviously was an inspiration. Where was there anything else? Because I, I, every other step of the way, it seems like you've been doing this alone. Even I'm letting myself edit here. Even like after later, even your <laughs> essentially your exhibition phase, you've been doing on your own, right? But maybe for that stage, as this was forming in your mind, as it, as it was, was uh, percolating, you, you maybe you were open to uh, other things well, other than that. Uh, yeah, photo I mean, essay. the early, uh, the early sort of, I wouldn't even call them documentaries. And in fact, to use the word documentary about this film is not. It's a work of nonfiction, but to, it's not exactly s- technically. A, I, yeah, yeah. I, I can't quite figure out what the word is. I call it a, a hybrid essay film or. Uh huh. Yeah, whatever. People are always looking for that, right? right? That's that's what that's potentially the most challenging thing is a lot of programmers don't want to struggle for that because right. they they figure that their audience needs to get it immediately what they're yes. looking at. Yeah. And you well, can't always do that. No. And then you're cheating the audience essentially too because You're right because you're not giving them the chance to to, I, to yeah. discover new things. You know? Well, it's very you're, that's a very but, interesting observation, Adam, because uh I was surprised, but I, I won't mention the festival. Uh because, but it got the film got accepted into the competition there. You know, it, they they didn't have like an experimental section. They had a documentary section and a fiction section. So it was accepted into the documentary section. The uh, I found out from someone who was on the jury that uh, the head of the jury instructed everybody on the jury not to vote for my film for anything because it was quote not a documentary. And I just was like. When I heard that, first of all, I had to laugh a little bit, you know, because mm-hmm. uh, it just shows you that pomposity and 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 uh, elitism, right? Aesthetic elitism uh, exists in every aspect of the filmmaking business. Business, not just Hollywood, you know. The independent business is is oh yeah, I see what you're saying. Is, it's is just it's... It's just as ex- as exclusive yeah. and and close minded, and it's like what the fuck, just. Why call it anything? Just watch also, the movie. The jur- the the jur- the head of the jury was is at odds with the programmers because they decided that your film was a documentary for the purposes of this particular of in terms of programming it. So then, you know, why should this mute I guy agree. mutinize? I agree. You know, and do that. That's uh, I know. Why not the- let Why not let them make up their minds? Yeah, you see what I'm saying? It's, yeah. But certainly, the the early films of Herzog, some of his. Because I wouldn't really call them documentaries. Uh, he did a film called Fata Morgana. Mm-hmm. He did the uh, a film about a, a a sculptor who was also a, a ski jumper called the uh, the Ecstasy of the Sculptor Steiner, and it has the most amazing slow motion footage. Oh yeah, have you seen? Wait, uh, he yeah, but he you're right crashes into the gets really injured though, or doesn't he? No, 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 he doesn't. I he thought, doesn't get injured because he He's was he the first he... one that learned how to basically flying, uh, ski flying, ski flying. So they, but he learned how they redesigned. The, there was a certain point where they were paralleling, and then where later on they learned in order to avoid accidents uh-huh. that they had to kind of cross their skis, and there was a different uh, design and right. things that, like that. But that, I remember that work, and in fact, I just saw Herzog. He was in Brooklyn about a month ago. Did you right. do you hear about that? Where he's at Pratt. I heard about it, yeah. Even though it was free, you had to RSVP and get a you know a ticket. Somebody gave me a ticket, so I went. And he, they showed the clip from that film. That oh, great oh, film. Oh. Yeah, yeah. But continue, so I'm sorry. Yeah, but they're, I'm just saying, his yeah. films were about a subject that, that then elevated it or kind of even went deeper into it to such a degree mm-hmm. that it became a little surreal. And, and, uh, and you Oh, entered, for sure. You entered another level of awareness. And... And that's what I was attempting to do with this film. I mean, it's uh, yeah, it's it's most assuredly not a documentary about the subway. It's all shot on the subway, uh, but it's a uh, it's a journey. It's like it, this idea of of how he even came up with the title is that I began to really see that that it, it it's like an alternate universe down there, you know. And on one level, you can just say. It's people sitting on the train. Mm-hmm. On another level, it's quite different. Uh, 
especially when you consider the fact that it's it's probably the the largest subway system in the world, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah. And and the numbers of people Unless there's something in China that we don't know. The about. numbers of people that use it yeah. are just so astounding. And so that right. when people enter the system, they almost become or feel that they become invisible because there's so much humanity around them. Well, and so thinking that they're invisible, I've noticed that people actually reveal things because they think no one can see them, right? Hmm. And so and so those were the moments that that I was after and uh and and it became like it's almost like this was a a a flip side to the to the world that's above ground, you know, something that's a little more meaningful, a little bit more resonant and um that 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 was the structure that I gave the it's film. It's interesting this alternative existence underground. It's sort of a a whole other set of rules in a way, you know. Uh, well, of, it's of, also it's almost like being in outer space or underwater. Yeah. Because everybody's in these little capsules, right? That are just hurtling through darkness. <laughs> right. Exactly. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And yeah so yeah. you're in these little self-contained little yeah. bubbles of light, right? You know that move and uh, and and we try desperately to normalize that mm -hmm. experience too mm -hmm. whether it's looking at your phone now as everybody right. does if you look around it yeah. that's another film mm -hmm. <laughs> where did the title come from or do you just remember i just sort of came up with the words i wanted something that because i know a song like that's called that oh really i, I didn't I think know so uh i think so unless i'm mistaken you already said that as you were making it uh we're understanding what you were doing and it was taking shape in your mind and maybe in your editing and et cetera, that you felt there was definitely an audience for it and that people would be able to relate to it. Were you thinking about a, you know, whomever that those people looked like or that number of people? Because you've run, you know, it's obviously the biggest challenge for any filmmaker, let alone somebody who's doing something that you could call experimental or where you really isolate yourself from, from those consideration, commercial considerations. Almost, almost entirely. I mm -hmm, understand you. Mm -hmm. You do feel like people can relate to it, and I absolutely agree with you. But how has it been for somebody who's been making more on the surface commercial types of fare? Well, I mean, one could argue that there's no, been a good. couple. No, of... That's a that's a really good question, yeah. and and I have to tell you that <laughs> it's, there's no difference, uh, honestly, because yeah. because every one of my films, I have faced the most just astounding challenges to just get them in front of people. Right. Uh, so this isn't new to me. Uh, in some ways, it's a relief to not have to worry about well, we, yeah, all the people that you're disappointing or right. frustrating because or right or let's or, say let's say a distributor right had paid you know advance uh, of a million dollars and you know and now I have to worry about opening weekend, you know, and reviews and and all that shit. You know, I I don't have to worry about it. And and listen, it just feels good to have made something that I'm proud of and that that uh, mm. I feel has meaning and mm -hmm. and you know it's I, I don't expect it to 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 get mass audiences but I, I do think that that it's it's a highly entertaining film you know it's it the one thing that I will say is that I've made a conscious effort to to keep it always like what's gonna happen next once you lose that in a movie I don't care what it is when the audience doesn't give a shit what happens next or they feel like whatever happens next they don't care about right you you're gone the movie's gone mm -hmm. i mean it you know mm -hmm. and it's a crucial element it's not it's not like action it's not like oh it's just the sense that the film is proceeding towards something and the element of surprise is still possible and i tried to work that into this movie uh but yeah you know ifc you know we tried to get, you know, more than one night. Uh, you know, I appreciate that. But I, I do think the film could have had a weak run there. And it may still, somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, when we see what, what sort of reactions people have. But, I mean, here it is. It's it's just under a month away from the screening. And it's almost sold out with with no advertising whatsoever. So right. that's... Yeah. Word of mouth. Yeah. Yeah. There's no doubt you could have had a good... And also... You, I think, frankly, I mean, I talk about this all the time. People are probably that listen to this are bored out of their mind hearing me say this, but I don't necessarily think there are very many films that need a full week theatrical. By and large, 
you know, you, you have a theater, they need to fill the, they need to screen films, uh, I suppose, and they need to figure out a schedule where each weekend, which is when they get 90%, I'm sure, of their business is, right. is, is on the weekend. There's almost no film anymore where I can't go on the second weekend and know that, that I could just roll up and see the, any movie I want because right. by the second weekend, almost every film is already gone. Yeah, if it's still around for a second week, it's at like a much smaller capacity right. audience-wise. So right. I always feel like, man, if there was a way where you could just have a weekend theatricals, uh-huh. that to me makes most sense. And I'm, when I say weekend, I just mean Friday and Saturday. Uh-huh. Well, I mean Sunday, I guess, too, it could be, but not mm-hmm. by, by Sunday night, you're done. Because mm-hmm. nobody's going to the movies. I mean, when I say nobody, mm-hmm. very few people are going to the movies on Sunday night, let alone Monday and Tuesday and mm-hmm. Wednesday. It's just so quiet. Mm-hmm. You ever go to a movie on a Wednesday afternoon in any theater? No. no. Nobody else does either. <laughs> I mean, no. they just don't. So the theaters are sitting there more or less empty most of the week. I mean, with very few exceptions. You know, mm-hmm. The system is kind of broken. I don't know how a lot of these theaters, I guess they can do things like play your movie on a Monday night mm-hmm. because the audiences aren't going to be showing up at droves for the other films right. that are there for the week. So I think right. that... This definitely could have used, I think, a good, strong weekend. And if you could somehow manage to change it so that, you know, you get your reviews for just a weekend, even mm-hmm. a weekend of screen, right. screenings, I think that would be great. And and uh, you absolutely would get a, a review mm-hmm. if it were okay to review films that are just playing for a right. weekend right. because you are you have such a, an, a, an impressive track record. So that that's my thought. I, I feel like a big part of the theatrical exhibition system is kind of broken. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. I would agree. Uh, you know, which ties into the whole, you know, critical yeah, uh, exactly. connection, too. Right. Sure, sure, know. of course. Uh, but, you know, that's the system. It is a... It's a and, you know, listen, uh, you know, Adam, I, I'm just... I'm glad I made a film that was outside the system. I really, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. the fact that I don't have to worry about reviews, I just, you know... Mm-hmm. Liberating. It's liberating. Yeah, yeah. It's also, I think, more natural. It's more... Mm-hmm. It's more... It is organic. It's more organic. It is, because you know, us... these things, like reviews, are, shouldn't affect anything. Right. They you should, know? They, exactly. Pe- word of mouth is... It should be an... A- review should be an afterthought, if that. Yeah. You know, yeah. because, uh, you know, the only thing that matters is, is to, to... It all... Listen, let's not get too, you know, artsy-fartsy right. here, but... Um, Where else are we going to get artsy-fartsy well, if not I'm here? I'm just saying, you know... Yeah. If you if you want to be in the film business, you you have to realize it's a that business. It's a business, and it takes a lot of money on all aspects of it. You know, you might be able to make a film cheaply now, but nonetheless, to get it out into the world, still costs money. Right. If someone is going to spend money, it's common sense. They're not going to do that unless they know they're going to get their money back, which influences what they accept to release and how they release it. You know, and it's a it's just a it's a strange strange cycle but um it just seems to me that i recall films uh i mean i'll tell you something that's really encouraging that moonlight won best picture i mean that is that is like incomprehensible to me Mm -hmm. considering Mm -hmm. right considering that rocky won best picture do you understand what i'm saying yeah yeah yeah. i mean well, I don't care what anybody says. Rocky is a stupid movie, you know. It, it's you're talking about uh, forty years ago, right? Yes. Yeah, Rocky, which you know <laughs> spawns it Creed. Won you best know, picture. Okay, that's all right. I'm not being yeah. elitist. I'm just saying. But it was that was an independent film too. I know it, but still, look yeah. at it. Yeah, and it was opposite Network and tra- Taxi and, Driver. By the way, I know that. Yes, right. Was Network yeah. the same year? That was that's astounding. Um, but the fact that Moonlight won, that is encouraging because I really like that film. And I, I thought it was a really, really brave and and, and difficult film. I mean, Which one? Moonlight. Oh, Moonlight. Yeah, very true. Yeah, I agree with you. It was really um, very, very moving. And that it could, you know, win Best Picture or yeah. almost not win Best Picture, but then yeah. win Best Picture. Right. Listen, I plan to get back into the, you know, the fray because that's what it is. It's a fray. It's a know? fray. What I mean by that is you got to... You got to accept the fact that you have to push and shove and kind of get attention and try right. to get attention. Accept it that that's part of what the business is. Yeah. Uh, you know, you cannot be a, a, an independent filmmaker today and and just sit back and and, and wait for it to happen. It's no. it'll, it'll you know you have to fight and 
and uh you know i wanted to get this one out of my system uh you know i may i may make another one like this but but uh just doing it all on my own was was completely uh exhilarating and uh you know i have several ideas for for scripts that involve actors you know mm-hmm. narratives mm-hmm. and but doing this movie has shown me that if it came down to it i would rather take my little camera hire unknowns mm-hmm. and just make the film exactly the way i want to make it mm-hmm. and time after time that has proven to be true again let's just talk about moonlight who's in that movie no Nobody. there were no stars in it i mean you know in the Af- i mean i guess but still you want the actor mahershalu the one right. who played, you know, right. the the drug dealer, yeah. the father still, figure in the first act. But still, what he he, he has he's pretty famous because he's on uh, House of Cards. Yes, but come on, you know, but I the, mean, but there weren't any big star name above no. the title type of name, you know, in that film. I just, and I can't. It tell couldn't cost very much. Uh, what it's been like on every single movie that I've made, you know, t- just trying to get the financing. Oh know? yeah, no, I remember you just telling me, and it's what I hear also from your colleagues. Well, even you even know. in my very first film, Johnny Swade. Mm-hmm. I met yeah. this young unknown actor uh, who had come in to audition for me. This was my first film. Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, we had looked and looked and looked and, and could not find someone to play this part because either they, 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 they just were too stupid or they didn't get it that there was, there was a, a vulnerability to this character. You know? mm-hmm. And uh, my casting director said to me, uh, there's this young guy coming in today. You know, when you look at his resume, don't be uh, freaked out. Judgmental about him because he's yeah, because he he's, he's got, got he nothing. Did, he's got a he got one little tiny Canadian TV series on it, and this movie that's just finished shooting that nobody has seen, called Thelma and Louise. And I looked at his picture. And I said, "He looks interesting. Bring him in." Mm-hmm. The second I saw Brad Pitt walk in, I said two things: A, this is my guy. This is Johnny Swade, mm-hmm. and B, this guy's going to be a star. All right, I cast him. I call the agent. Yep, yep, you're cast. My producer goes, whoa, 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 whoa. What are you talking about? You're not casting that guy. I said, what? This, this was like a $500,000 movie in 1991. Uh, he goes, yeah, I'm not, I'm not paying for that guy. He's nobody. He just he refused to, to compromise in any way. I had to turn my back on this guy's money. Really? Yes, so- I did. That's how, that's, how, that's how confident I was that Brad was this was was the guy. You know how long it took me to get $500,000? It took four years. Wow. I walked away from it. Uh, and fortunately, you know, I stumbled into another deal two weeks later. Wow. Was, but you didn't know that. I didn't know that. Obviously. But, uh, you know, I had kept this one woman sort of aware of what was happening. Uh, and, and still, no, it, there was no guarantee that she... Did Brad Pitt know that what you did? Yeah, that would have been... Kind of foolish. Unfortunately, it turned out well yes, for you in every way, and it's a terrific it. movie. If you haven't and, seen uh, it, so it's just like when you fight those battles, it's yeah. like I don't know. It's you know every movie that I've ever seen that's really meant something to me mm-hmm. has had basically you know people doing parts that they either normally would never do, mm-hmm. right? Like even like Midnight Cowboy, you know they mm-hmm. they almost didn't cast John Voight in that in that part, mm-hmm. and you know. He's astonishing in it. Yeah. So it's a tr- it's a it's a it's a struggle. I would I would love to uh, make a movie completely they want to make it and yet still have it get seen by a lot of audience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Write that down. <laughs> Could, let's you know. see. Get that. You know where you have complete control. I think it is what you want. Or 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 or, or, the, dealing, or, with people, or yeah. dealing with a with a company that 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 isn't you know so myopic and and just stupid in terms of you know what they think marketability is yeah there's so many distributors but you know i don't know how many are w- willing to really step mm-hmm. step out you mm-hmm. know and take a real real artistic risk mm-hmm. you know like they they probably just look like it the, you know the bottom line they gotta right they can't really afford too many missteps in, right. in the kinds of films they choose you know mm-hmm. i mean I don't know. Was it different in 1991 and 1993? Uh, it was a little different because everyone still had this thought. The distributors had a – since it was still such a wide-open game that they they, feel, they figured that one of the hit films might hit, you know, so yeah. that, you know, since it happened with a couple of films, it happened. Yeah, and they don't – they. you were talking about like uh, uh, Sex, Lies, and Videotape Sex, Lies, and, and Reservoir Dogs. Well, this was – 
Yeah, before Reservoir Dogs, I think Stranger Than Paradise. Stranger Than Paradise. That, yeah, that became the next sort of like thing to people for people to look up to. Well, you shot that. I did shoot that. Yes, coincidentally. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but, but the thing that changed all that yeah. was Pulp Fiction, which set the bar to a, to a ridiculously high yeah. That was point. Beauty of the End. That was the Jaws of the Independent. It was. Ones. Yeah. It was. Uh, or the Rocky. So. But it was different. I mean, there was definitely a sense that uh, the, uh, that if you got the film made, which was which which was a miracle, and you got a distributor, well, there was never any question. Once you got a distributor, let's say in 1991, 1995, there was never any question that the film wasn't going to get a theatrical release. Right. Yeah. There were no other options. Yeah. And so <laughs> right. that, that that was such a a great feeling. Yeah. Knowing that even if it played for a week or whatever, you you were going to get a beautiful theatrical release. And I still I still just believe that that the the theater going experience mm -hmm. is a valuable experience. Sure. No. Yeah. Well, I guess a lot of other people feel that way too. I mean, there's no shortage of theaters mm -hmm. and they're being built. They're not Right. They're but... adding new they're adding theaters to the city. This oh, one. Yeah? yeah. Good. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm sure uh, I've already talked to you about that, the Metrograph and all these mm -hmm. other theaters that, you know, that are are playing films like this. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you originally meet Buscemi then? How did that happen? He, I know he was a downtown guy mm -hmm. who, you know, you probably just ran in the same circles, right? Uh, Living yeah. in... Uh... I knew who he was. I mean, one of the most fascinating things about being on the Lower East Side at that time, I'm talking about... I first moved to the to the city in 1976. The year Rocky came out, by the way. <laughs> Where were you living before? I was. I had just gotten my 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 bachelor's degree in creative writing. Oh from wow! Old Dominion University in in, in Virginia. Oh okay. And I Old got accepted Dominion. to NYU Film School, the graduate film school. So I decided to come up okay. here. But where were you? From? Where you? Where do I know where you're from? I'm trying to remember. My dad was in the Marine Corps, so I was oh. moving around every two years. But okay. at that point, I had just finished four years in Virginia, uh, at a Got small it. college uh -huh. in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, but what I was going to say is, I would walk to school, you know, from from right. my loft in Tribeca to to East Third Street. Everything that you saw on the streets was all done by posters and like handbills. You'd see new bands. You'd see. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, theater groups you'd see you know all this stuff on lampposts everywhere um and one of the things that kept appearing was steve buscemi with his partner mark boone jr right going to be p performing uh midnight at the limbo lounge or midnight you know uh yeah. at the mud club and and uh so i went to see him a couple times because um i knew him through jim i don't think steve i think the first film that that Steve did with Jarmish was uh, Mystery Train, mm -hmm. uh, but I went to go see Steve, and and this, he did this most amazing play in which there was hardly any dialogue at all for the first forty five minutes. It's just two guys, him and his Boone, Mark Boone Jr. Yeah, on these little cots, and they're kind of walk around, sniffing each other, and kind of pushing each other, and curling up, and trying to go to sleep, and 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 after about thirty five minutes, one of them says. Okay, now listen. This time, I'll be the male dog. You be the female dog. <laughs> they were like dogs for, <laughs> for thirty minutes. It was so brilliant. Yeah, and, uh, you could do it. It was part of a whole. Yes. You know, there was a process of experimenting. It wasn't like here's this one thing. It's got to be a commercial success. Right. It's just like, oh, well, this one. If it doesn't work, we'll go to the next thing. You but know, it was and, still entertaining yeah, as hell. It right. was. It was hilarious and kind of spooky and with a real sort of surprise at the end. And uh, we just became friends. Um, at one point, I had spoken to him because I had originated Johnny Suede as a one-man show oh. that I performed, uh -huh. right? And when I turned it into a screenplay, you know, I loved Steve, and I thought of, about him playing, you know, in the movie with me. Yeah. You know, uh, but all of that quickly changed when I realized that I, I, didn't, I didn't really feel comfortable directing the film mm -hmm. and acting in it for my first film, you know? So anyway, but but uh, you know, I put him in Living in Oblivion, mm -hmm. and that uh, you know my uh, my admiration and love for him just you know mm -hmm. skyrocketed. He's he he is absolutely an anomaly in terms of an actor. I don't think I've ever met an, another actor who is so completely selfless, 
but yet brings his entire self. Now, do you know what I mean by that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Most actors, and I'm not being critical, okay? You have to hear me on this. Most actors are so self-obsessed that all they can think about is mm. themselves. And in fact, there's a really basic acting exercise developed by Sanford Meisner mm-hmm. called the Meisner Technique, in which all it is is two people just sitting and looking at each other. And it's to develop the actor's you know, awareness of being taking attention off of himself and putting it on the other actor. In other words, the other actor forces him to act. It's not bleh, just mm-hmm. just the actor acting by himself. Mm-hmm. You understand what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Mm-hmm. Buscemi, I never made one suggestion to him that he looked at me and said, fuck you, I'm not doing that. You know, he either could either smiled. Most of the time what he did was he would just kind of smile. And, you know, I would I would always I always take the actors aside and I just whisper to them. I don't I don't make broad announcements that everyone can hear. I whispered to the actors and I whispered something to them. Just a little thought. And his eyes just lit up. Mm-hmm. I went back, sat by the camera, action, you know. And then you just watch him take off. And it's, uh, he flies. He goes wherever, you know, he wants to. But yet it's always within the realm of the film, which is another rarity. A lot of people give you their gifts, their acting gifts, but it doesn't always go with with what the story is in some way you know and uh he's turned into a great friend i think he's a really really great filmmaker as well you know and uh i just i love the guy and he'll be there on june 19th to, mm-hmm. to uh moderate the q a that's gonna be fun to watch yeah uh well thanks i thanks Adam. yeah this has been great yeah you know it's nice to be on the other end of this thing yeah is there on your new york premiere i think it was was woodstock your new york premiere well, out of state. <laughs> what? Out of state, New York. Here's the here's the Gary Winogrand book. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to take a quick, quick, quick look at it. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, I love street photographers, and oh, look at that. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, that's, especially this one. <laughs> She's beautiful. Look how beautiful she is. But oh, you look should, at that. Isn't that beautiful? Through some of these things, I'm like, going to. Like, you know, the what, yeah. what you know, just, just these little moments. Of, yeah. Uh, right. They become surreal. Like this is this is a famous famous picture. Is it? Oh yeah, I know. Yeah, but I tried. You know, I tried to take that idea and use it with the moving image. <laughs> this is nice. I know. I'm looking at a young woman's, or well, I'm looking at a woman from in the pool under the surface, swimming with a pig, a, a piglet or a small pig. It's really funny. This is a great book. It's been great. Thank you. It's been nice to see you. As I mentioned, Karen Cooper has been oh boy, decades now. She's been programming, film forum. She really is an icon in the world of, of programming. She's kept this theater going, uh, no, obviously not alone. She's just working with a team of people that are really, really good at what they do. And Karen is certainly a great example of that uh, in the kind of programming they do because it's just sort of anybody's guess what's going to be a hit and what's not. So we get a bit into that nitty-gritty on in this conversation. Uh, I mean, why bring on a programmer if you're not going to pick their brains about how they do their job? I mean, how do you know what's going to be, a, you, do, uh, you know, the answer is you just don't know, but you get a sense of what might be good and you have to trust your instincts. And programming is a bit smart and it's a bit instincts and who knows what else. So we hear a little bit of that from Karen. Plus, what makes a good bucket of popcorn? So we get into that too. And also what's coming up on uh, at Film Forum. I hope not all of it is past tense at this stage now that I think about it. But anyway, here, here we go. My conversation with Film Forum's Karen Cooper. Where does one begin? Let me just describe things to listeners. Um, I'm interviewing Karen Cooper, who is an institution herself, just like Film Forum. Uh, you, you just refresh my memory. I want to say you've, you're a founder of the Film Forum. I know you go back to... The original location, right? But where, I'm not the founder. But not you're not the founder. founder. You came. No. He. They hired you. Not as. Not tell me. A little grayer. The area. Okay. Is I'm sure you've gone over the story so, once or twice before. So but, but humor clear. me. A um, couple of years out of college, I was writing for a very undistinguished film magazine and writing about what was happening in exhibition and about Film Forum, which was a 
tiny loft space on the Upper West Side with 50 folding chairs and a 16 millimeter projector the size of a large toaster. And um, thought Film Forum was doing a terrific job. Peter Feinstein w was one of two founders, but in its second year of existence was the only one left. So this was now, uh, uh, let's see, the spring of 72. And um, we had dinner one day and Peter said, can't go on like this, can't make $100 a week forever, leaving town, getting married. Do you want to take over the business? And I asked what the business consisted of. I'd never run a business. I was all of 24. And he gave me a suitcase of those purple mimeographed you know, <laughs> copies of letters, which before they were Xerox machines. We're going back to the Jurassic period here. And I remember I, them. I read, yep. read his copies. Loved the film because, hated the film because. And I thought, gee, I was an English major. I can write those letters. This isn't so hard. And... Of course, the place grew over many decades incrementally, but it really was a, a tiny little operation. Yeah. Film Forum is located on West Houston, where it's been for some time. Is it, is it the third? Fourth. The fourth location? Yes. Okay. Fourth incarnation. Thank you for... Yes. Okay, very good. And it seems to be the permanent spot for the first... I would say so, yeah. yeah. And it's on year 40 what? Well, at my anniversary? Well, you do the math. Okay. So it's 72. 72, so it's that 40, I can do. 40 plus years. Yep. Okay. Okay, uh, so this is your entire life. It's it's really remarkable when you put it in that context. D does that ever, you ever like think, oh, I could have done this or I should have done that or why didn't I try something different? Have Actually, you ever been really, really tempted no, to just... Kind, I'm kind of a monomaniac. Been... So once I this fits you. started it, it fit. And it, um, you know, people think running a business is about running a business. It's actually about solving problems. And the most interesting problem is, of course, what you put on the screen. Mm -hmm. So that's the most exciting part of the job. But there are a lot of other things that come into it that have to do with uh, technology and changes and personalities and, and how A fits into B and mm -hmm. writing. I mean, I was someone who fancied myself a writer and I do write the press releases and calendar copy and um you know so language is a big part yeah. of what i deal in right uh so okay so were you were obviously never that tempted because i'm sure there have been, must have been offers along no, the way no actually there's never I, no one has ever tried to hire me away i am so ensconced <laughs> that no, just... no, and i i guess i'm really not famed as a team player oh. you know i'm really my own little you've, idaho yeah you've existed in your own yeah, um, I'm isolated so, yeah <laughs> okay well you've done an outstanding job let's let's just thank you be honest here there's no doubt about it film forum has a pretty amazing reputation and um, a lot of pedigree at this well, point. Well, I think s certainly some of that uh, is due to the extraordinary work that Bruce Goldstein does as director mm -hmm. of repertory programming. And Bruce began that part of, of what it is we do back in the late 80s and has continued to do the most extraordinary work in bringing classic films to the screen and, and finding movies that are previously undiscovered, finding finding and encouraging studios to restore prints that previously only existed in uh, you know some broken down form. Uh, so I, I think it's really the symbiotic nature of the old films that Bruce finds and, and puts brings back to life and the new films that Mike Majori and I uh, select to show that gives the place a certain dynamic. That's exactly what Bruce said. Well, he was right. <laughs> uh, you and Mike are, are programming the, let's say, the contemporary cinema. Exactly. For the, for premieres. Premieres. The old New York City theatrical premieres. Gotcha. Uh, and one screen, so one screen is dedicated to the repertory and the other screen. I'm just this exactly. point devil's and then advocate. The third one is for premieres. Is kind of catch as catch can. If something does particularly well. Oh, you have that. Uh, one, we have the ability to move it Fluid, over and continue right. it running, or we make other deals outside of our calendar deals and and for films that we think have uh, greater outreach. I mean, I am not your Negro, mm -hmm. the film by Raoul Peck. Raoul based Peck and on, his brother, uh, yeah. Yeah, on mm -hmm. uh, James Baldwin's writing has been running now for uh, about 10 weeks. Yeah, well, that was a, a Oscar-worthy. Yes, should have won the Oscar. Should have. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, uh, and that that's a nice 
do you, okay, let me, let's take that as a, as a, an example, because uh, you brought it up. Could you foresee that success? Did you have a sense that this would probably uh, have a good run or? You know, I mean, I don't want you to have you to say, I don't know what I'm doing. So, no, but You can and you can't. Mm -hmm. we, uh, both Mike and I felt it was an extremely strong documentary <laughs> that did something entirely different when dealing with race relations by bringing back Baldwin's writing, which was so prescient and mm -hmm. so really to the point in, in ways that um, I can't think of anyone who, who comes close to him. It's true. There was a moment, if I recall, I have, it's been a few months, where I think he just says exactly like how long it's going to take until there's a black president or something like, you know, he almost, I, he made a mention of it almost to the exact time, yeah. you know, when Obama. And it's been dead almost 40 years. Yeah. So that's pretty amazing. It is as well. Yeah. But, you know, to answer your question, mm -hmm. the real answer is nobody knows anything. Uh, yeah. I mean, we, we thought it would do well, but as well as it is doing, no, we did not expect that. And a lot has to do with timing, how a particular film appeals or doesn't appeal to the public and what kind of uh, press coverage it gets, what kind of attention Raoul Peck received as mm -hmm. the director. Right. Uh, right. There, so for as many examples of I Am Not Your Negro, there are as many that are... Sure, that flop. That flop. <laughs> yeah. That flop. That's Flops. a good way of putting it. And we don't need to necessarily mention it. But there, so in film form, it is a lot of... a. Um, Art house. I mean, it's almost entirely right. Art house, uh, I guess, is a way to describe it. There is some indie films, uh, like American Indies, creep in from time to time, right? Oh, plenty of uh, American Indies. Sure. Yeah, yeah. That's another thing you have to balance, I suppose, too, you because foreign and American work. Yeah, and also stuff that's in some. Yeah, the, there's a different couple of different demographics at play here, right? I mean, you know, when I remember when you like, I remember when computer chess was here a few years mm -hmm. back. And I believe, in fact, I had on uh, the, the filmmaker, Andrew, uh, at the office over on West Houston above the theater. Uh, but um, and it seems like, oh, this is like a Sundance hit. Yeah. You know, it doesn't necessarily seem like the, the typical film form. But then I think about it and I. I figure that, well, you know, film form also has to probably think about the age you know, group and, and demographics of their audience. I don't you know, know, we try not to be too strategic. Okay. I mean, yeah. I think you can over overthink these things. Who's going to be interested in this film? And it's a good film, but is anyone going to come to it? In fact, if a film's a good film, mm -hmm. it should be able to find its audience. We played a documentary called The Creeping Garden, only yeah, documentary on slime mold ever made. Now, that sounds ridiculous, but in fact, it was beautifully done. It was beautifully photographed. It was a gorgeous scientific film that had the sensibility of a science fiction drama. And mm. it, um, it was like nothing else I'd ever seen. Did it have a big audience? Nah. But it certainly had an audience of, of people who read the Science Times or read Scientific American or, you know, majored in biology. And I, I am actually not none of those people. Okay, I read the Science Times. But... Mm -hmm. It, it was just a wonderful mm -hmm. combination of visuals and uh, scientific insights. Were you having great conversations afterward then? I mean, it seems like that film would, as most do, would lend itself to a good Q&A afterwards. Both filmmakers were here. Uh -huh. And I, I have to confess, I'm generally, it's generally Mike Majori and not I mm -hmm. is, at is the, the person who... Moderating or present. ...sort of face at the theater. Yeah, I understand. Uh, you, do you occasionally do it? Occasionally, okay. I do it. Yes, okay. I do. Okay. I didn't know if it was sure. No, no. Uh, you did mention you're a very private person. <laughs> so yeah. One of the reasons why I was very excited, actually, to to sit with you. So, and I appreciate. It. Uh, well, I know that sounded like a film, The Creeping Garden. Is that what the Creeping Garden? Like, yes. I, I remember it. The synapses are tingling a little. I do recall that, but I didn't see it. I didn't see it. But uh, I just imagine that if the filmmakers are available. They should come to. It would make sense that they would try to come to as many screenings as, sure. as they, they can. Do. Yeah. They do, yeah, yeah, because I especially mean, I mean in the evenings. From England specifically for the opening. Oh, okay. And I don't think the film had ever played in a theater before. There's so much of their gardens, those British, you know. Anyway. You know, there's a great Dutch garden movie I played just a few months ago called Portrait of a Garden. Oh. That follows two men who are horticulturalists who've taken care of a, uh, a garden that's about three, four hundred years old and. Um, 
it's just a wonderful year within the garden that you spend. You mm -hmm. know, again, gorgeous cinematography and an appreciation of uh, nature. I, I, you know, I don't want to help Bruce out, but I smell a, uh, a retrospective of sorts, like Green Thumb Festival or you sorts. Know, Bruce is really his own uh, yeah, his own man. I don't yeah. see him, Bruce doing the Green Thumb Film Festival. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's a, it's a natural. <laughs> I think we're going to get a – think about how many people love gardening, you know. You get all the British expats coming because mm -hmm. they all love gardening. And then you can play being there. and um, So, uh, oh, well, I noticed that you have a bunch of postcards and programs uh, fanned out over the table here. Do you do you want to tell me? Uh, let's see some of these things that are coming up. Sure. There's um, a new film called Reservoir Dogs. Reservoir Dogs is a repertory release, and I certainly recall it, but I'm I'm no expert. My Have you not seen it? Oh, I've seen it okay. from years ago when okay. it was originally released. I'm on more solid ground talking about yes. the premieres. We're opening Obit, which oh, is yeah. a documentary filmed in the uh, New York Times obituary desk. And features a number of writers who uh, really bring to life all those dead folks. I mean, it's a surprisingly funny and compassionate and humane film for a subject that you would think would be terribly depressing. It's not at all. It's really quite quite wonderful. Well, most of those uh, obits actually focus on the life of, of the person. So, sure. therefore, it's just a little bit of a homage or, or celebration of a life, usually. Exactly. And, and the, to hear some of these... Uh, anecdotes because i saw the film at tribeca last year in fact mm -hmm. i did have the filmmaker on the pot on my podcast vanessa uh, gould vanessa right and her producer caitlin uh burke i think it, uh and yeah and i was gonna you know across the street from susan norgate i might i was thinking maybe i'll stop by and say you know you get me some of the obit writers on i'll do another piece sure. on it you know, let's do another piece on the right. on the film that's worthy of it. You know, I saw it. It was at Tribeca last year. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, it's a great documentary. It's a beautiful Very entertaining. Film. Again, my mind goes to uh, perhaps down the road, a retrospective. Have, I'm, I'm going to be doing a screening with Bob Mankoff and uh, some of the, uh, oh, the cartoonist? cartoonist editors yeah. at, at DCTV. I'm part, I, have a, uh, I, I have my own little film series called Docularius, which are funny docs about funny subjects or yeah. comic subjects because we all need laughter in our sure. lives at the stage especially at so any stage, at any stage I'm but right. in particular now even though it's on hbo mm -hmm. but bob mankoff doesn't come to your home and talk to you after sure. you've seen it on hbo and it's another very very uh just really fun documentary and you know and it kind of play nice with a bit actually even though they're very different and they're different peer, you know right. journals of course but of course Anyway, uh, sorry I interrupted you. No, no, not at all. Following Obit in uh, the middle of May, or actually early May, May mm -hmm, 10, mm -hmm. we're opening Manifesto, which is based on the mm -hmm. uh, Armory show at the Park Avenue Armory, which was a multi-channel video installation with the actress mm -hmm. Kate Blanchett playing oh. 13 different roles. I did read something and about that. she's really extraordinary. She's chameleon-like. Yeah. I mean, unrecognizable. She plays a homeless person. She plays a very um, kind of slick TV announcer. She mm -hmm. plays a sexy punk rocker. I mean, there could be 13 more disparate personalities. Mm. Sounds like a one-woman show almost. Like, it you is know, a one. Like it, that's Anna exactly what Smith it is. Or something. Mm -hmm. It's a one-woman show, but the text that she is reciting in, in these various... Uh, vignettes it, it is each one is a different manifesto by um, whether it's I'm not sure if I ha have the authors right but we're talking about major folks from uh, you know the communist manifesto to uh, Dadaism mm -hmm. to uh, Klaus mm -hmm. Oldenburg talking about pop art minimalism and so forth and both political and artistic cultural manifestos that are very Intense and for the most part very serious, but mm -hmm. it's, the visuals are often very playful and over the top. So it's a great tension between the visuals and the text. Okay, very good. It, I, I don't suppose Kate Blanchett will be here, but no, uh, we can hope. We can hope, but we're not sure about her. The invitation's schedule. out. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you that Wendy Whalen will be at the th theater, and she is a uh, 
marvelous ballerina who spent several decades at the New York City Ballet oh. as, a, as a principal dancer and has since retired from New York City Ballet. Not Balanchine, but Peter Martin's Well, body, I think right? she was there during Balanchine, the very, really, very end, end of Balanchine's oh, wow. era. Um, she has since retired from the New York City Ballet, but has gone on to dance, modern dance at the Joyce. And this is a documentary called Restless Creature, Wendy Whalen, which deals with that period in her life when she was making a transition. Mm-hmm. And it's it's fascinating because you don't think about, well, what happens to ballerinas when they're no longer in those tutus. Right. right. When they age out, which can be like a you know, short lifespan for right. a majority of them. That's true. You no. Know. Um, especially the Balanchine school, because it really beats up your feet and legs. And well, that's a part of the the whole subject is, is are the various uh, injuries and uh, operations, and mm-hmm. you know coming coming back from those terrible situations that she had after dancing for decades. Right, of course. Uh, I think I read the Suzanne Farrell or one of those ballerinas mm-hmm. books. But she danced for you know George Balanchine and quite fascinating it's like a guy that is obviously one of those brilliant one of the most brilliant people ever and yet tortured so many so many yeah. young women it's a give and take anyway that what was that called again you mentioned it's called restless creature restless creature oh there it is with the wendy, wendy will yeah. mm-hmm. and that's uh, starting may 20 may 24 24th and Great. wendy will nice. will be at the theater oh terrific i'm hoping opening night maybe other nights as well uh this is a perfect film for richard Okay, but it's, he, are they? They're not. He, they're not uh, distributing not, it. In right? fact, the distributor of the film. Right. Although we have a lot of he no longer films on the next calendar, but we work with a lot yeah. of distributors. Well, I'm sure. Obviously. Well, of course. But but I can understand why Kino would be a regular because mm-hmm. they're they're distributing a, a lot of these art art house films. It makes sense. Complete sense. That's a, that sounds like a great one. Any others that uh, I can see? Well, I, I, um, I'm asking, but I can see. Yeah, we have an unusual number of dramas. Uh-huh. Coming up this summer, one of which is a uh, very Chevrolian, set in, on in Claude. The, the, yeah, set, set on the border of Switzerland and France. Okay, and it stars two of France's most esteemed actresses, Natalie Bai and Emmanuel Duvos. Mm-hmm. And it's a psychological thriller in which one woman believes the other woman is responsible for a hit and run accident mm-hmm. that killed her son. So they circle around each other in very uh, wow. kind of scary, creepy ways. Yeah. But two great actresses in a, you know, this gorgeous mountain setting and uh, mm-hmm. French Swiss border, and that's called Mocha. M O K A is oh. the title of the film. And it's a fr- fr- Dutch French film. Is that what you say? It is a French Swiss. French production. Swiss. Excuse me, yeah. French Swiss. Okay. And the filmmaker is Frédéric Mermot. I, I love French cinema. You're gonna love it. Um, I'm gonna. Look, <laughs> I, I take your word. Who is distributing that one? Just, just for my own. Film, yeah. film movement. Film movement. Yeah, another, another company but, with a lot of very good. True. Films. Yeah, that makes sense. Again, I uh, would have said that one too. So I, I assume you're you you go to Cannes. I assume no, actually I don't. Do you Mike not goes go? to Cannes. I go to oh, Berlin. Do you, you go to Berlin, we, we which is overlaps. The word, right. The world, yeah. You do. You, you divide and conquer, as it were. Well, we divide and hopefully make deals. But you, wouldn't you be able to sort of decide who goes to what? Because do he decide. doesn't have to go to no, those. No, he doesn't have well, to. How, do, do how does going to Cannes help him put on a, a 75-year-old film about, you know? No, no, you're thinking of Bruce. Mike goes oh, to Cannes. Oh, Mike, you Mike said. I'm not listening very Mike well. Mike goes not... to Cannes, and he goes to okay. Sundance in Toronto. Oh, go you don't to, go to Toronto. Okay. I go to Berlin, and I go to the Amsterdam Documentary Film Festival sure. every November. And usually at least one other festival. Right. So there was a year when uh, Mike and I had grants to go to a number of festivals in South America and Asia. So I went to uh, Yamagata. In, and that's in obviously in Japan. Japan. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, I think um, Mike went to uh, Buenos Aires. And we've, we've really kind of covered both the A list and the B and C list of festivals. Yeah. But the big ones really are Berlin, Cannes. Yeah. Toronto Sundance. Do you is there a festival that you haven't been to that you really kind of would love to go to at some point, and but you know, maybe it just doesn't make sense? There with are your... parts of the world I'd love to go to that yeah. I haven't been to before. But maybe. festivals, as interesting as they can be, are not as critical as they once were. So many films that that Mike and I look at, we see 
through streaming. I mean, we see them through sure. uh, professional sites, Vimeo sites. And yeah. It's not as necessary as it once was to and travel. I understand. Uh, when you're looking at a film from a, from a programmer's perspective or, or context, you're looking at it at a different way. Like when I watch films, and you know, uh, granted I don't program for a film forum yet, or uh, I'm just kidding, uh, I, I would love to one day, but, but it, you're looking at obviously how strong a film it is uh, from a just, you know, from a dramatic standpoint, let's say if it is a drama in fact, or, you know, you, you can watch it on a small screen at home or on your, here at the office and tell. Watching it in a movie theater is always a nice option, sure. but it isn't essential from the programmers. Exactly. If you're going as a movie lover and a film fan, that kind of thing, then you know it's optimal to obviously see it on a beautiful projected, in a beautiful projected. I think a, like, a strong film grabs you emotionally and it grabs you intellectually. It can, right? And, and you, but you still cheat yourself when you're seeing it, maybe on a. I think comedies are the ones where you get cheated because it's it's more fun comedies. to be. With an audience that's laughing and that's that picks true. up on things that you may be slower at picking yeah. up on, especially those Eastern European comedies are tougher to get the humor. Are you talking about like Romanian, the Romanian, right. the, how dry and slow the, the pace exactly. and the, oh, okay. The dry, slow Romanian. I would agree with that. The, yes. You know, the life and death of Mr. Lazarescu, a wonderful I film. Loved it. But, and yeah. I did, I did get the humor of it sitting alone. But it's much funnier if you're with a hundred other people who immediately see how ridiculous it is that right. two doctors are talking over a, a man's, you know, body as he's suffering and talking about when they're going to take their next coffee break. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, that kind of of humor is is it not, lends itself to the exact to uh, they have that infectiousness that you exactly. only get in a theater. I, yeah. yeah, I agree with that. That's true. Or going into the film format because you get some great popcorn which you can't you know necessarily get at home true. Or... the secret of our popcorn you know is that it's fresh it's made every day and what isn't sold is thrown out the the dirty secret of commercial theaters popcorn is they keep it at the end of the evening and they mix it in with the new stuff oh, the next days. afternoon and you're really eating a bunch of old popcorn and new popcorn it's sort of, i don't know 50 50 depends on where they started. So you're eating stale corn. Not this is good. an expose. I and had no really, idea. I thought I knew everything you know, about bad everything. stuff going on there. We also don't sell popcorn with butter, you know. And I've had people complain, where's the butter? Where's the butter? Bring your well, own. Well, it's, it's really a question. I was told years ago by Dan Talbot, who runs uh, the Lincoln, Lincoln Plaza, and before that had Cinema Studio and the New Yorker Theaters, wonderful theaters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he said, whatever you do, don't let popcorn in. You'll never get rid of the smell. So that's been mm -hmm. our that's butter. Been our the role. butter, the that's, butter smell. Right. I, I never it gets like rancid butter on it. And yeah. No. Right. And it does good. even when it's not. It does smell. You're going to get a smell. It, exactly. And it, and eventually it just becomes permanent. <laughs> that's, that's what he said, and he okay. was right. Yeah. So we've... personally, I didn't expect that we'd be talking popcorn, but I'm perfectly happy to do it because <laughs> I I've always preferred just to slightly salted. That's that's yeah. plenty. Yeah. You know. What do What do you think? I, I think I asked Bruce about this too. Uh, but what do you make now of the the theaters like Alamo Draft House? I'm just curious what someone who's Alamo been Specifically Alamo Draft House, I haven't been there. You haven't ever been? No, I okay. haven't been. Um, but there are a lot of new theaters, and I think it's terrific. It's, well, that's it another question. It creates a certain dynamic. And if people are getting more excited about going to movies instead of staying home and watching Netflix and streaming, I think that that's a good habit to get back into. There was a generation in the 60s and 70s in which the latest Godard movie or mm -hmm. Fellini film was the hottest thing everyone was talking about, rather than, you know, maybe Trump's press conference. I mean, it which really was... Which is a daily was, event. Or, really, exactly. Or, it was breaking news. Or the latest, you know, series that on, on television, whatever, on television yeah. which, which has so replaced the discussion. A lot of these new theaters, um, I mean, we, we are not in any sense challenged by them we think it's it's only makes the landscape oh, right. more exciting i agree with that i think that's true that's not that wasn't my question i mean i agree with that perspective that the more theaters out there i think helps everybody because yeah. it gets people again you're right into getting out and, and and once you're appreciating that experience and if there's an emphasis in the theater of really trying to make the experience for the theater goer a positive one then you'll say oh this is nicer than just staying home sure. another the, you know, Friday night right. or whatever. You well, know. I think there's and, a generation uh, that's really gotten stuck at home, and we have to get them out. Yeah. Well, it's very expensive 
if you have kids, to go to the movies because not only are you paying for the movies, but you're also uh, either bringing them or you're paying, getting a sitter potentially. It's, exactly. it's an expense. However, so the idea of watching something on Netflix becomes all of a sudden far more appealing. However, for those who aren't raising small children, let's say, or who just still prioritize going out to the theater, I see that a lot of the theaters, there are there is a certainly crop of new theaters or new newly revamped theaters with additional rooms or new rooms. Mm-hmm. And also, I, I mentioned the Alamo Draft House only because, yes, they have a big theater in Multiplex in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. And I guess, you know, probably there's a wait and see how it does before more come to New York. I think it's going pretty well. I think so. But, you know, they have really good, again, good programmers and they're mm-hmm. doing things and it's very pro. But they do enforce this no phone rule. They enforce, enforce no talking. They'll throw you out. I mean, would Absolutely. you, would well, you throw our, people our out? Our audience is self-enforcing. It is. I mean, I, know. I think our audience will throw you out if <laughs> yeah. you talk. And we don't have any commercials. I mean, yeah. I think it's kind of silly to make a big deal about all your rules and how serious you are about your movies. If your audience is serious about the movies, if the programmers are serious about the movies, about getting the best films on the screen and not just mm-hmm. taking whatever is coming down the pike from Hollywood, then you're going to have a more well-behaved group of people who are watching what's up there. Uh, yeah, film, the people that go to film forum, and it's pro, it's it's the correct way to say it. you don't say the film forum. It's no, it's without, it's just film forum. Film forum. Yeah, have the article. Got it. Those are predispo- people predisposed for kind of like a serious c- cinema. I don't mean to say they don't have a great sense of humor. I'm okay. just saying, you know, or that they don't let their hair down and like to see fun, you know, fun, you know, uh, comedy, whatever, action movie. But that they go and they are self- very good at self-policing in that regard. They're probably a little less likely to pull out a cinema, a, a, a cell phone, let's say, or start a conversation in the middle of the movie than they are at your average multiplex which is maybe playing the latest high, highly stimulation, you know, mm-hmm. high stimulation film, like, you know, yeah. whatever superhero film or what have you. So, you know, that's my point. I guess this is, uh, I'm going over obvious ground at this point, but uh, I was just kind of curious what you thought about ordering a uh, catfish sandwich and a beer. I think while that's you're... rough. I think that's rough. I mean, people make noise when they're eating. Their utensils make noise. The waiter makes noise. How do you pay for the damn thing? I, I think it really credit card, um, yeah. credit card, but even so, or it's cash, dark yeah. and you know. Yeah, they come by. I think it's a distraction. It's I think a little it's bit, tremendous yeah. distraction. I mean, if you're reading a book, would you want somebody um, putting food in your face while you're you're doing that? And I think watching a movie should be an immersive experience if it's a good movie. Mm-hmm. If it's worth watching, it, it should be worth watching and not eating at the same time. Or at least if you're eating, to my mind, it should be something that's pretty easy to eat like a bag of popcorn so i'm not Mm -hmm. i'm not enamored of this dining and and watching movies experience maybe in kansas city it's okay there's a new yorker in me speaking um just that there are so many good Mm -hmm. restaurants in new york that to have to go to a particular movie house to both eat and see the movie i would rather go to the restaurant i want to go to and do that before i why cheat yourself go ahead do both that yeah. night you know by the way i think karen was referring to it. kansas city kansas if you're listening not kansas city iowa just to okay. be because <laughs> we don't want to lose any of my iowa listeners you know it's a very big film t- uh state i'm gonna make sure i got to everything before before you uh, other than the, that, two or three festivals though. Do you get to get? Do you go out to the movies at all? I mean, I, I know we've established you. Str- you have to watch. Your schedule is such that you're streaming or you you're know, at the film I stay for. in for do movies. You know? I go at, almost yeah. every weekend. I spend several hours looking at at Vimeo's. I but yes, the the, the, the truth is yes, I do go out to movies and I do see commercial work. My husband's a member of the Academy, so we get all those DVDs. Uh, what does he do? Uh, he is an animator. George oh, was he? Griffin. Yeah. Oh, George Griffin. Yeah. I say it like I, so, I'm familiar with it. Of him. course, I do. I do see commercial work, and I think that's important. I want to know what the landscape is like, and there are marvelous commercial films. I'm not mm-hmm. someone who thinks that it has to be an independent. To but be you a, don't. You don't do a lot of value. the party going and events. Just not going. my personality. I, not I, a party I animal. No, no, I get it. Because you do have to put some. You have to put some of your attention into keeping aware or being aware of the landscape, as you just sure. said. And so, getting out and seeing. These other movies that you're not likely to program is is sometimes important too. Absolutely, and, right? And an ear to the ground, so you must read a lot, I assume, and 
I just do. talk to other do you talk to other programmers a lot other than no no really no, you did say at the beginning you were fairly isolated <laughs> not, not so i understand not particularly. and it works for you it's yeah. clear whatever you're doing continue to do well thank you <laughs> <laughs> you know people can go to filmforum.org right it is org right yes and they can uh, download the program you you have always have the latest film uh, schedules up there i i'm checking it all the time and you can join the film you can join film forum you can. You can become a member. It's a and very be, good deal. It is, right? It Do you is. get discounts to the you screenings? Get, or? $75 a year, and mm -hmm. uh, students and seniors, $50, so a third off. You get in for $8 instead of 14 so it's really the best deal in town. Right. So it makes complete sense. And it's it's so easily, it's very accessible. The theater is located uh, just West uh, Houston, just west, Houston, west just of Sixth couple. Avenue. Very close to so, every subway that goes to West 4th Street. Right. And the one train. And the one. And, right. Uh, right by the one train as well. The Houston stuff. If you happen to live downtown, easy mm -hmm. walking distance, Soho, the village, NoHo. Oh, this is great. Thank you so much for, for doing this. Uh, Thank you. You know, Karen Cooper, you're the, what's your official title, by the way? So I just Director. Sure. Director of Film Forum. Correct. I think you would be great. You, you don't give yourself an I think you should be in the lobby more and meet all your... I could change uh, the title to Tsarina. I'm sorry to think that. <laughs> <laughs> Might work. Maybe then you can affect the government for the next president, too. Right. If you're... Thank you very much. It Thank was a real you. pleasure to talk with you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for listening to this episode. Please do subscribe to us on iTunes. Give us a star rating and a uh, review. I, I ask you that every week. And uh, I don't know. I guess you don't really take me seriously if you're listening. I mean, if you are hearing these words coming into your head right now, if my words are in your head, you know, inside of there, and I'm actually ordering you to go to iTunes and write up a review or a star, give a star rating, how can you not do it? How can you not do it? It doesn't make any sense to me. You don't really have a choice. So go to iTunes, search Film Wax subscribe god forbid you haven't subscribed yet i believe you must have subscribed but if you haven't subscribe and and just give us a star rating and a review and what happens is when people search other people that don't know about my podcast i'm talking about not talking about you 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 know about my podcast and you listen to it but for those who don't the way they'll find it is if when they're looking at other similar kinds of podcasts they, my podcast will come up as a suggestion or it'll come up in search results when they're searching for other film podcasts that's that's what happens it's starting to happen so it does work and then the more people that find it you know it just grows it grows it grows so please do do me the simple kindness of doing that you can also find us on facebook of course and and, and like our page that helps, too. All these little things. You know, we have a newsletter. You can go to our website, filmwaxradio.com, and subscribe to the newsletter. You can uh, go to Twitter or Instagram and and follow uh, what we're doing. It really makes me different. We're on YouTube. You can subscribe to our channel. We're on Stitcher. And um, uh, as I mentioned recently, we're going to get ourselves onto Spotify. We're going to get ourselves onto SoundCloud proper. In other words, I when I think about it, I sometimes put stuff up on SoundCloud, but I've got to get an account going, and I mean, really get it going. So we'll we'll do that. So people can find us everywhere. There's no excuse. Okay, everybody, thanks for listening to Film Wax Radio, episode number four hundred and twelve. Film Wax Radio is your independent film interview podcast. We're presented by Rooftop Films. Thank you for listening. So. Until the next show, which is next week, please do take care of yourself and the ones you love. Bye-bye.